Okay, then, good morning, good tag, Jen Dobre once again. Uh, as you can read, and as it was already announced and introduced, my name is Matthias Magdowski, and I'm a scientific co-worker and lecturer at the Otto von Gericke University of Magdeburg in Germany. I will tell you in a moment where Magdeburg is located. As you can see, I'm working for some institute for medical engineering, and even if I don't have to do uh, too much with medical engineering, but I work for a chair for electromagnetic compatibility, and I think this is also the reason why most of you are here today. Um, so before continuing with my slides, I would also um, share some information about the IEEE EMC Society that uh, Christoph also already introduced a little bit. So we have a website, you can see the link here on top, um, the emcsociety.org, and you can find all information there, what we do, what we are. Maybe most interesting uh, for you and what I've already talked about, this EMC Society is um, organized in different local chapters. So you, if, if you click here on chapters, um, then we can check for chapters and chairs. And now a map should open up. And if we zoom in into Europe and zoom in into Poland and wait for some time because uh, my internet connection here obviously is not the fastest and the map needs some time to load, then Something should pop up here, and this is so that this is our local chapter in Germany, but this is the local chapter in Poland. Um, if I click on this here, right, right here in Poznan, where we are located right now, and you, you see the contact of Christoph. And so, IEEE uh, organizes lots of technical activities like this distinguished lecturer talk here. And if you like this, if you like something like those, we are always looking for active volunteers who also are um, active organizing stuff within the IEEE EMC society and within the local chapter. So please be invited um, to help us with our work if you like this. So title of my talk today, um, as already announced, Robust, Precise, Fast, Choose Two for Radiated EMC Measurements. Um, before diving into the topic, I would once again, try to introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I was born in 1984, like the like the book. Um, so you you can calculate yourself how, how old I am. It's it's in this year. It's especially easy to do so. I live in Magdeburg. I will show you in a minute where this is uh, located uh, within Germany. I married. I have two children, and I have a background in electric engineering. So I studied electric engineering um, more than 20 years ago at my university there in Magdeburg. Um, I, I have a diploma degree, so it was at this time we did not have yet this bachelor and master degree, so I'm a diploma engineer. And since 16 years, I worked there as a scientific co-worker, uh, researching and lecturing. I also did my PhD there about, as you can read, comparison of stochastic and deterministic field coupling to transmission lines. So something like this that I will talk also about today. Um, immunity measurements in anechoic chambers and reverberation chambers. But today I will talk more about the emission, not about the immunity. And since 2015, I'm also active as a flying faculty lecturer, giving not only talks like this one for the IEEE EMC Society, but also lectures for students. I've been to... Um, to Israel, I've been to France, and former times I've also frequently traveled to Russia, which of course doesn't work anymore. So I've lots of experience in this. This is the building of our faculty. This is also where some of our laboratories and where um, my office is located. And this is another picture of our city. So we also have a river like here in Poznan. Our river is called Elbe. Uh, we also have lots of churches and a large cathedral. and it's it's also quite a nice place, so um, you're invited to visit Magdeburg. It's it's nice to walk. So we we don't have this big historic old town because um, large parts of the city have been destroyed uh, during the Second World War. But it's it's of course nice to walk along the river there and uh, visit the cathedral, visit some museums. And if you wonder where Magdeburg is located, so it's um, west of Berlin, about one and a half hours by train or by car, somewhere in this triangle between Berlin, Hannover, and Dresden that 
most of you might know because these are more the touristic destinations within Germany. So we are, we, we are in the central eastern part of Germany, let's say. And um, what Magdeburg is also famous for, and who was the name patron of our university, Otto von Gericke, uh, it's a picture of him. He was also a scientist and a researcher, also an, an engineer. He was also mayor of the city for some time. And he did, um, he, he also kind of invested ESD. So yesterday when we visited the laboratories, there's also some, some test bench here for electrostatic discharge. He also kind of invented this because he had a large sphere made out of sulfur uh, that you could rotate. And then due to triboelectricity, you could separate charges and make tests with these um, charges. But what he's more famous for is the Magdeburg Hemispheres, an experiment that is displayed here. So he took, he also experimented with vacuum and he invented the air pump. So he took two large hemispheres, about 60 centimeters in diameter, and put them together just with a seal and then sucked the air out of it. So that within these hemispheres, there was nothing or very, very low air pressure, uh, very good vacuum. So these hemispheres were pushed together by the force of the external air, by the, by the external air pressure. And to demonstrate, to show how large and how powerful this force is, um, he, he did the famous experiment with eight, you can, you can see it here with eight horses on one side and eight horses on the other side. And these 16 horses in total were not able to pull the spheres apart because the force of the, of the external air is, is so high, so large. And then the legend says that a small boy child came, opened up the valve and the air would flow back into the hemispheres and then the hemispheres would just fall apart because this force was now, the external force was now missing. So he, 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 maybe also kind of invented science communication to people. Um, and we, from time to time, it's, it's of course, with the horses, sometimes it's, it's kind of challenging and difficult, but for anniversaries of the university, we sometimes um, repeat this experiment. So last year, our university celebrated its 30th anniversary. And, and there we also did this experiment, I think just with 12 horses and not with 16, but um, it's still kind of impressive. So you, you, you might know the picture with the horses trying to pull something apart also from, uh, from a big jeans manufacturer. So uh, same experiment, but different force, of course. Yeah? But I think Levi Strauss, uh, he, he, he has stolen this idea from. <laughs> Okay, so just some organizational matters. Uh, if you would like to have a copy of the slides, no problem. I will share them to Christoph and, and he can uh, distribute them. You can also send me an email, um, no problem. There, there might be a recording. So I'm doing a recording on my computer here. Hopefully it works. You never know. There will be a recording by Tom. Uh, so we will see, maybe. And if you have questions in between, um, with pleasure. Don't, don't wait till the end. We can have, we, I think we still have lots of time towards the end for Q and A, but if you have questions in between, don't hesitate to ask the question. Um, even if I'm speaking very fast and without period and comma, just, just raise your arm, just interrupt me. Um, don't, don't wait till the end with questions. Don't wait until you probably have forgotten about the question. Okay. So then let's dive into the topic. Um, I'm not sure if everyone is really, really from the field of EMC. So motivation is for sure that um, we have and we all use lots of electric electronic devices all the time. And these devices on purpose or unintentionally can create electromagnetic fields and will create electromagnetic fields. And then these fields propagate and can couple into other devices. And this can create some disturbances. And every cable that you have everywhere will also act as an antenna. It will radiate fields. It will pick up fields. And so we might have sources of disturbances like this Wi-Fi router here. They could create and will create electromagnetic fields. And then they could create some disturbances, for example, in a TV set, something like this. And so... We want to ensure that such interference, such 
incompatibility not happens. So we want to ensure that there is electromagnetic compatibility between these devices. And the, the question that everyone asks is, will there be some interference or not? Will there be sufficient immunity of devices and there will there be um, only only low emissions? And today I want to, I will somehow focus on the emission side and as said, compare different test environments with each other. And then the second thing is that uh, many engineers working at laboratories that sometimes, unfortunately, they just apply standards and don't think about the underlying physics. Um, so what really happens there? How does the field look like? What are properties of this test environment? And they just say, okay, push the device on a test in there. We have some software. We push a button, um, run some automated measurement and don't really think about what happens then and just apply the standards. So just applying standards is of course easy. It's more challenging to, to understand and to think about the underlying physics. But this is what I would like to encourage you today a little bit to do so. So I invite you to don't be that kind of test engineer that just applies these standards. So this already brings us to some kind of fundamental question. So if we want to somehow measure and analyze and evaluate uh, the electromagnetic uh, magnetic emissions of some device on a test, and the question is, what is a good measuring to do so? And what you measure in anechoic chambers and semi-anechoic chambers is field strengths measured in volts per meter, or you can also express it in a, in a level, in, in dB microvolts per meter, something like this, in a certain distance. So the measurement facility here at Lukashevich is a three meter chamber. You would do measurements in three meter distance. And typically you want to do the measurement on the far field conditions. Um, so you can start to do measurements there, let's say from around 100 megahertz. Then another idea would be not to measure field strengths, um, because here this would be electrical field strengths and there in, in, in the far field, there's a fixed ratio. But if you go to near field, um, there might be higher magnetic field than electric field and vice versa. So what would be also interesting is to measure power flux density in watts per square meter also at a certain distance, because the farther you go away from a device on a test, the smaller the signal, the smaller the amplitude will be. Um, and the other idea, and this is what we do in reverb chambers, is to measure total radiated power. So what is radiated over all the directions of some equipment um, under test. And the next question is, in which environment will we do this measurement? Is it, is it really a reflection-free environment that we try to rep replicate or reproduce in a semi-anechoic chamber where there are no reflections at all? Because if you look in, in, in a typical environment, maybe like this um, office room here or meeting room here, um, at least this wall, and maybe the outer wall, I think this is a drywall and this, I, I'm not sure, but there will be lots of walls made out of um, steel reinforced concrete. So there will be reflections from steel walls, there will be reflections from the ceiling construction and so on. So in, in real life, you don't have this re perfect reflection for your, for your environment. There will be some reflections from the surrounding. And then if you go to industrial places with lots of metal around, if you go to if you are uh, located in a train, in an aircraft, in a car, um, in a big ship, then there will be lots of metal around. So you have an environment with lots of reflections. And then the question is, is this field strength in a certain distance measured in, a, in an anechoic environment? Is this really a good measurement to measure practical EMC emissions and, and disturbances? Um, so these are really the, the fundamental questions I think everyone should think about a little bit and that I'm trying a little bit to discuss today. So structure overview is, I will briefly talk about measurements, what is done here at Lukashevich, um, measurements in, in semi-anechoic chambers and anechoic chambers. Then I will talk about measurements in reverb chambers, what we do more in Magdeburg or what we, we do also measurements in semi-anechoic chambers, but me myself doing lots of measurements in reverb chambers. Then the question is um, how to convert or how to correlate these results. And 
um, as discussed in the interview before, it's a little bit like compa comparing apples and oranges with each other because it's a, it's this kind of a fundamental difference between these two um, environments. But at the end, both both tastes should taste good. Both should should give you a kind of similar answer. And then um, to to prove this a little bit. Um, I can show you some measurements that we did with some generic EUT in, in our semi-cold chamber and our reverb. And at the end, of course, there will be a summary. Okay. So let's start with semi-cold chambers. Um, so first thing is if you want to measure emissions, you want to measure emissions just of your device on a test and if you measure immunity, you also want to potentially only uh, disturb your device on test and you will not want to disturb half of the city around you. And for emission, you, you don't want to measure all the Wi-Fi stations and all cell phone base stations and radio stations and so on. So first thing is you need to shield yourself from the environment. So shielding works with metal walls. So you take a metal room, uh, put, you use walls for uh, metal for the walls for the ceiling for the floor and the these metallic walls act for the electromagnetic waves like a mirror so everything that comes from the outside um, will be mirrored back but everything that um, that you create at from um, in terms of emissions on the inside would be also mirrored back by the walls so imagine you are in a room uh, where there are mirrors everywhere and you, you switch on a flashlight. So what will happen? It's, it's getting bright. Yeah? You, will see, you will see lots of reflections because um, light will be reflected and re-reflected and re-reflected um, and you don't know where the light is coming from and then where the light is going to because you will see lots of reflections of this single beam of light from a, from a flashlight or from a torch. And the same would happen with the electromagnetic fields inside such a shielded room. And this is also what happens in the reverb chamber, but there we somehow deal with it. But in the, in the anechoic chamber, you don't want to have this. So um, you need to do something so that the walls are not reflecting anymore. If you, if you think back to the analogon of this room with lots of mirrors, what you could do is, like in the Rolling Stones song, paint it black. Yeah, you could take some black paint and paint the mirrors black. And then the, the mirrors won't reflect anymore because this, the black paint on the surface is somehow absorbing um, the light waves. And light is also just an electromagnetic wave. But does anyone know what is the wavelength of visible light? In, the, in hundreds of nanometers range. So somewhere between, let's say, 400 and 700 nanometers. Very tiny, very small, and that's why the tiny surface roughness of this black paint is sufficient that um, if, if there's some, some ray of light coming, yeah, so the, the surface of the mirror is very flat, so you get a reflection with the very same angle, and the, the black paint has a very rough surface, so if, the, if some ray of light is getting in there, it will be reflected and reflected, and if it may exit, it will not exit with the very same angle. And so our electromagnetic waves, they have much lower frequency and uh, much larger wavelengths. So we need something like black paint, something like a rough surface um, in, in, the, in the order of magnitude of the wavelengths. And, and I mean, these are these absorbers that you have then all on the walls. It's, they act like black paint uh, for light. And then usually there's a turntable. You put your device on a test on the turntable, let it radiate, and it will radiate in all directions. But all directions will be, will be absorbed and just the direction that more or less directly goes to the receiving antenna, this is what you measure. And you know the distance and then you can rotate the device and test on the turntable and measure the emissions in terms of field strength in a certain distance as a function of the rotating angle. And so you, you, you might already see some 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 kind of um, advantage and disadvantage here. So the advantage is we can say what the device on test will radiate into a certain direction. But if it, for example, radiates exactly to the top or radiates to the bottom, you will not measure it because it will it will just go into the absorbers. 
And so the, you could do the measurement also in a fully anechoic room, then you would just measure the direct path and in a semi-anechoic environment, the floor is reflecting, the floor is made out of metal. Um, so you, you do not have just a direct path, you also have one reflection at the ground and then you do a height scan with the antenna to capture the positive interference between the direct path and the, the path with one reflection that has a slightly um, more, more length and then there will be a phase shift and can be positive and negative interference between the two waves. And that's why you do a height scan with this antenna. And this is how this looks like in practice. So this is a picture of our large semi-echoic chamber that we have in Magdeburg with 10 meter measurement distance. This is an older picture. Uh, if you look at recent pictures, then the, this is the, the back wall. Then these absorbers at the back wall are a little shorter because we, uh, we built in uh, another large door there so that we can easier move larger cars, vehicles in and out. Okay, so what you would really like to measure there in a perfect world is radiated field strength in the far field. And you would like to get the maximum over all directions at and, and for all frequencies um, of, of interest. And in, in, in practice, what you actually measure is um, radiated field strength in a certain distance. So at low frequencies, it must not necessarily be far field, but if you are is three meters, 10 meters away. Um, in most cases, it's okay. And then you do not really get the maximum over all these directions because you cannot measure all directions. You typically just do certain steps with the turntable, um, maybe 90 degree, maybe 30 degree, maybe less, but then it's consuming more and more and more time to do so. So you, you cannot really get this maximum. And you cannot also measure all frequencies. You have a certain frequency sampling. And as already mentioned, if your device on, on our test radiates to the top or radiates to the bottom, then you neglect this. You, you, you will not measure it. It will not get to your antenna. Okay, so then let's look at reverb chambers. And uh, just to check how, how far I will go into detail there, um, I've prepared a short survey. You can, you could use your cell phone and scan the QR code if, if you have. And we can look at the result. And uh, so you can, uh, there should be uh, on this webpage a survey with these five options. Um, and the options that you have is, I've never heard of this before, or I know that it exists, but um, I've never really used it, or I'm, 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 I've heard it and I'm, I'm at least familiar with the fundamentals of already done some measurements, or uh, I have and I'm operating my own chamber and I have lots of experience. Would be interesting if someone checks this, <laughs> but I don't expect it to be. Okay, there's just one cell phone looking at uh, and another one, so I will wait for for some more seconds. And then switch over to the browser and take a look at the results. Okay, and we have five voices. Um, maybe I will, oops, I will reload. Okay, but some people say they are at least familiar with the fundamentals and some say, I know that it exists, but I've never used it. And we have no experts and um, we, we interestingly also have no people that never have heard of it before. So it, it, it's, maybe, it's maybe a thing in EMC now. Okay, so a simple idea of a reverb chamber is once again, if we want to do emission or immunity measurements, we need to shield ourselves from the environment. So once again, we take a shielded room. And as already mentioned, this shielded room brings this problem that we also get lots of reflections and, and echo of these electromagnetic waves inside the room. And that's why it's called also a reverberation chamber because you have this 
reverberant environment with lots of echoes of the same field. So we get lots of waves traveling back and forth um, in different directions within this room and they will superpose with each other. And then once again, there can be positive interference. So where the, where the different waves traveling in different directions will add up and will reach a high field strength. And there can be also negative interference or deconstruction of the wave so that a positive wave and a negative wave will somehow cancel each other. And so what we get is a, is a standing wave field. So we get points in space where the field strength is very high and where the field is oscillating a lot. And these are the anti-nodes of the standing waves. And then you get points in space where the field strength is very small or is almost zero. And this would be the nodes of the standing waves. And so now if you, for example, if you do some immunity test, if you want to, so you, you take your antenna, you introduce some field and you get the standing wave pattern. Now you would need to take your device, device on a test and move it around in space to find some position where you have a high field strength. And of course, you do not want to do this. You do not want to go inside the chamber during some test and move the equipment on a test around to find some position where you have high field strength. And you could, of course, you could maybe put it on some turntable and, and move it around, but usually you may have cables or something like this attached to your device on a test. So you, you usually you don't want to move the device on a test around. So the idea is, like in the saying, if the prophet cannot go to the mountain, the mountain needs to go to the prophet. You leave the device on a test in space, in, in, at the position, in place, and you move the field around. You move the standing wave pattern around in space by changing the, the electromagnetic boundary conditions of this cavity resonator, by changing the reflection of the waves. And to change the reflection of the waves, you take a large metallic object with large metal plates on it that has some, some strange shape and some kind of uh, big asymmetry. And you, you move this or you rotate this. And by rotating this, you change the reflection of the waves. And if you change the reflection of the waves, you also change this standing wave pattern and you move nodes and anti nodes of the field and minima and maxima of the field through space. So your device on test, even if it's at a fixed position, if you, if you rotate this and move this, this will see sometimes a small field strength and sometimes a high field strength. And then you do and repeat the measurement, um, for different positions of this, of this device here. And because these standing waves in, um, in electromagnetic field theory are called modes, and this is the device that we use to change the modes, to steer the modes. This is called a mode stirrer. And then the whole thing is sometimes also called a mode stirred chamber because it's a chamber where you stir the modes. But more common now is this, um, is the, is the name reverberation chamber. And this is how this looks in practice. This is a picture of our large reverb chamber that we operate in Magdeburg. Um, to be honest, this motorcycle, which is on the picture, was never actually tested for EMC. It was just placed in the photograph to make the picture look nice. It was a motorcycle of a former colleague in Magdeburg. And, uh, but this made the photo kind of popular. So if you check the English Wikipedia for electromagnetic reverberation chamber, you will also find the photograph there. And so here you can see the stirrer. This is the, the, also the old, so this picture is probably 20 years old. So this is the, the, the old stirrer, but you can see the different metal plates. And if you rotate this, you change the reflection of the waves, change this wave uh, pattern inside there. You can also see um, some field probes to measure fields. In the back, you can see some logarithmic periodic dipole antenna to, to create a field. Um, so these are the antennas that we use up to one gigahertz. And then above one gigahertz, we use these smaller uh, yellowish horn antennas here. You can also see a, a camera, a shield camera to look inside the chamber, also from the outside, uh, monitor the device and test. So this is how such a practical chamber looks like. Um, the chamber that we have in Magdeburg is about four by six by eight meters. So it's 
let's say half of the size of this room here and uh, so about 200 uh, cubic meters of volume and the first cavity resonance there is at around 30 megahertz and with the new stirrer we can operate and use this measure uh, this this environment this facility let's say starting at around 150 megahertz um, but one one disadvantage of this uh, reverberation shamus for sure is that they have a very strict low frequency limit so if you would like to build a, rever a reverberation shamer that would already work at let's say 30 megahertz then it would be really really huge and even building a chamber starting to work let's say at 80 megahertz at 100 megahertz then then you probably need to have a chamber the size of this room with a very very large stirrer and you need to have a very powerful motor to to operate this and drive this so then um something to give to give you something to think about and there will be a second survey in a moment um is that some years ago, um, some person asked me at the German EMC conference, EMV in Düsseldorf at this time, hey, you do measure measurements in, in this reverberation chambers. I, I have a question for you. Um, so if you do measurements and if you had hit a resonance of this, of this resonator, didn't you get then an incredibly high field strength? And so this is, this is the, 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 the second question for you today. So uh, once again, you are invited to take your cell phone, uh, scan the next QR code. And this will be also the, the last survey for today. Uh, so what, what happens uh, from your experience or from your um, knowledge or intuition of electromagnetic fields if we exactly hit with our frequency of excitation, some eigenfrequency of the chamber, um, which is the definition of a resonance if the frequency of excitation is the, is the same as the eigenfrequency of some resonator, what will happen there? There will be an incredibly high field strength or this is not possible because this frequency can never exactly match or nothing really spectacular because this is the usual operation of such a chamber or there will be a large power being reflected back from the transmitting antenna to the power amplifier. And I will give you some more seconds to decide on one of these answers. And then once again, uh, switch over to my, to my browser window um, to check the result of this second survey. And okay, there are just four now five answers. Um, but at least two of you said nothing spectacular. This is the usual operation of a reverb chamber, and this is the right answer. So if we operate such a reverb chamber correctly, uh, we, we always hit the resonance of the chamber, and we always not hit just one resonance of the chamber, we will hit two or three or four or even 10 of these resonances at the very same time. And we, we need to have this for, for proper operation. Um, because otherwise, if you have just one main resonance of the chamber, you can rotate the stirrer and do something there and, and nothing will really change. Okay, so thanks for participating. So then the question is, okay, wh what can we do to steer the field? As already mentioned, we can have this mechanical stirrer that is rotating. Um, you could also have a chamber where the wall is moving. Uh, I will show you a picture of this in a second. Um, what also works is that you change the position of the antenna. But then once again, um, you have cables attached to the antenna. It's somehow difficult. You need to have a good mechanical construction to relocate the antenna without messing up the cables. Or you could electronically switch between different antennas or, or have different antennas and then have signals with different phase shifts between the antennas, which also can, can be done very fast. So every mechanical movement always takes time because you have this mechanical inertia. Um, if you do electronic switching, it's very fast. But the disadvantage of the several antenna approach is that every antenna also 
introduces losses inside such a shamer and you typically want to have a quite high quality factor uh, at least for immunity measurements because this is one one main advantage of such rework shamers if i go back um some some pictures here so if you do immunity testing, you only need very, very moderate input power to reach a high field strength inside the chamber because of these resonances, because you, you somehow reuse um, the field. If you do an immunity testing or immunity test in, in, a, in an anechoic chamber, you take a very expensive and very powerful broadband amplifier, generate your signal, um, radiated with some antenna, then it will hit your device and test once, just once, and then it will go into the absorbers and will be converted, will turn into very expensive heat. And the idea of a reverb chamber is, okay, you take your power amplifier, you generate a signal, you transmit it with the antenna, you hit your device and test, but then it's reflected and you hit it once again and it's reflected, you hit it once again. So you can reach much higher field strengths in the reverb chamber than in a semi-nichoic chamber. And so for this immunity testing, um, you could also just do very narrow band changes of the frequency. So if you, for example, change the frequency from 200 megahertz to 201 megahertz to 202 megahertz and so on, um, there should be drastic changes of the field within the reverb chamber, but you would not expect a completely different behavior of your equipment under test because your equipment under test, if you do immunity testing, you do not expect it to be, to have a super high quality factor. So the, 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 the bandwidth, the resonant bandwidth there will be rather large in terms of 10, 50, 100 megahertz, but, uh, Due to the high quality factor, um, the bandwidth, the modal bandwidth of the reverb chamber will be very, very small. Uh, but, but this only works obviously for immunity testing because for emission testing, you cannot control the emitted frequencies by your device on a test. And yeah, the switching between several antennas, what, what causes losses inside the chamber, you have losses at the walls. This will be dominant at the high frequencies. And at low frequencies, you have losses within the antennas because every transmitting antenna also acts as a receiving antenna at the same time. And at low frequencies and large wavelengths, the antennas have a large effective area. So they um, suck a lot out of the field, out of this chamber once again. So another ice idea, a nice idea as mentioned is um, to have movable, movable walls. So what works very, very nice and we have also done lots of experience in recent time um, in Magdeburg, as you have might might seen if you if you look at my LinkedIn account, there are some videos and photos of this um, to do reverb measurements in shielded or in tents made out of shielding textile, metallized textile, and then you just shake this tent or you just move the walls of this tent. You can also place a stirrer inside there, but what is much more effective in changing these boundary conditions of the resonator is just shaking the tent and moving the walls of this tent. Um, and this is an idea that was made popular by my colleague Frank Liffering from University of Twente um, in the Netherlands, and he's also working for Thales. And Thales is a large company that does Lots of stuff. Um, they are, I know them because they build these caching, cashier devices in supermarkets. So sometimes there's, they are made by Thales, but Thales also develops radar systems, uh, for example, for ships. And if you want to test the radar system of a ship, ship is very huge. You cannot place the ship inside your laboratory. So once again, you have the same problem. If the ship cannot go to the laboratory or laboratory needs to go to the ship. And that's why. Uh, they made this in situ testing on ships with these mobile reverb chambers and behind there, there would be something like this radar antenna on the ship. Um, and, and so this is some demo. Um, and what you can see there inside is neon tubes and the field strength is so high that, um, these neon tubes are starting to glow and and here you can also a little bit see these 
the, the, the field pattern, yeah, the field that is usually not visible, so that there is higher and smaller field strengths and higher and smaller field strengths at, at different positions inside the room. And this is um, some chamber. I think there's one at Eindhoven, also in the Netherlands, and, and uh, this is a picture from uh, a Chinese university um, at Nanjing, and they have made a wall stirrer, and it, if it's operating, it little bit looks like something breathing in and breathing out and breathing in and breathing out. At the end, I would say it's it's a nice academic experiment. Um, it's not much more practical than just having a rotating stirrer. Um, it maybe consumes slightly less space, but it's a um, it's a very elaborate mechanical construction, and at the end you cannot move it really fast. And if you have a rotating stirrer, you can move it much faster if you like. And uh, so nowadays there are very fast sensing field probes, and if you change your field fast, if you measure the field fast, you can save lots of measurement time. This is uh, one one advantage of reverb measurements. Uh, being fast, but but this mechanical construction, unfortunately, is not very fast. Okay, so then short look on the statistical properties of the field. What you want to have at the end is a homogeneous field. Your field should not depend, at least in a, on a statistical basis, should not depend on position. So for one for one fixed boundary condition, for one stereo position, the field will be strongly inhomogeneous because you have this maxima and minima and nodes and anti nodes of the field. But if you rotate the stirrer and measure for different boundary conditions or for different positions of the stirrer. On average, you should get the same field strengths everywhere, except if you go, go too close to the walls because your walls are made out of metal and the metallic walls will short circuit the tangential component of the electric field and also the normal component of the magnetic field. So if you go close to the wall, field strings there will be smaller. Um, or at least the tangential one. I mean, the, the, the power of the field will then somehow go into the normal component of the electric field and tangential component of the, um, of the magnetic field. But the advantage is, it does not matter where you place your device on a test in the reverb chamber. It's long, as long as if it's um, far away or far enough away from the from the walls and from the stirrer and from the antennas. But then you can freely place it. And the second important property is you want to have some isotropic field. And isotropy means field is independent of direction. Once again, for one stereo position, this will not be the case. But for on average, for many stereo positions, you will get a nicely isotropic field. And this means it does not matter how to orient your equipment under test. And okay, orienting the equipment under test is maybe not such an issue, but um, this also means it does not matter how you orient your cables. So if you test the laptop, for example, like this one, you will for sure always place it like this. But then in an anechoic chamber or in a semi-anechoic chamber, th the result, the emission measurement result will strongly if you have some experience, you will agree with strongly depend on will you, will the cable will go into this direction and then will go to the ground, will the cable go in this direction and will it go to the ground, will the cable go in this direction and then will go upwards. And you, you might get completely different results depending on how you place the cables in such an environment. Why? Or th that's why most of the standards strictly define where and how to place cables and for which distance and how the cables should be terminated and when, where they will go to ground and so on. So typically you don't have this issue in a reverb chamber. You, you just place the cables somewhere and you don't care. And then it depends on still, it somehow depends on the cable, but it's more, more depends on how long are your cables? What are intrinsic resonances of the cable or how is the cable terminated at the end? And as said, uh, these statistical properties are only valid within the working volume. And the standard mentions that you should observe a minimum distance to the walls of water of the wavelengths. I would always suggest to have something larger, maybe half of the wavelengths, but um, something in this range. 
Schön cool. So, at the end, what we operate as a reverberation chamber for EMC purposes, every one of you has something like this at home. You call it microwave oven. You use it to cook chicken. We use it to cook electronic chicken, um, test devices for immunity. But a microwave oven at home is, is very similar. You have a magnetron that creates electromagnetic waves. You have this shield cavity. And then you also have these minima and maxima um, of the field. What makes that if you put some food in there, the food would get hot very quickly and burn in some places and in other places it might stay cold. And so what the microwave oven manufacturer does, it builds in this turntable so that moves your food through the field um, so that the food gets evenly hot. So if people don't really know what happens inside the microwave oven, they just put the food on the center of the turntable so that it rotates, but it does not really change the position. So it won't work as well as if you put the food, let's say, on the outside of this turntable that it really nicely moves through different field positions. So um, if you want to get your food evenly hot, put it on the outside of this table that it nicely moves through through space. Um, I mean, by the way, you can also um, you can also use your microwave oven at home um, to measure the velocity of light, if you like. So for this, you need a piece of a larger piece of chocolate. Um, you, of course, you, re you remove the aluminum foil and you put the chocolate inside the microwave oven. Um, and you, you need to somehow block or disable this turntable, or you need to put it in a higher, um, somewhere above, but it should not move. It should not rotate. And so what will happen is that the chocolate will burn at some places and in other st places it will stay cold. So then you, you take a ruler and you measure the distance between two or three hotspots. And from one hotspot to the next, to the next, you have you have a full wavelength of the field. And so if you measure this with a ruler, you get something, you should get something like 12 centimeters, which is the wavelength of the field at 2.4 gigahertz. And 2.4 gigahertz is the frequency that the microwave ovens operate. It's such an ISM band, industrial scientific medical, that is also used for Wi-Fi and it is also used for Bluetooth. Uh, why sometimes Bluetooth Bluetooth headsets fail if you operate them close to close to a running microwave oven. And so from frequency and wavelengths, if you just multiply them with each other, um, you get the, the velocity of light. And so if you do this um, 12 centimeters or 0 0.12 uh, meters uh, multiplied with 2.4 gigahertz, and this gives you the one over second, then you, you end up nicely with something like 300,000 kilometers per second, which is velocity of light. So it's, it's, it's possible to measure this, uh, with household equipment with a microwave oven. Say again. And the bar of chocolate, of course. This is, the, you, you need a bar of chocolate. Without this, it won't work. You, you can maybe also try cheese or something like this, but, uh, Something that where you can later on nicely see these hotspots of the field. Okay, so in reverb chambers, what we would like to measure is total radiated power for all frequencies, because if something radiates, it will radiate wherever it likes, but um, no matter in which direction it will radiate, it will be always reflected, reflected, reflected by the walls. And at some time, it will end up at our receiving antenna. So no matter in which direction your device and test radi radiate, you will always measure it with your receiving antenna. And what we actually measure is total radiated power for each sampled frequency. But there is some remaining statistical uncertainty of the field. And this is also mainly due to um, we have some remaining inhomogeneity and anisotropy of the field. And we also not measure all stereo positions. We just measure certain stereo positions. We have a limited sample size of our, of our statistical ensemble. 
So um, this somehow, let's say, a little bit falsifies the result. But th the big problem is why people don't really use this. There, there are no limits for this. So all the limits given in the standards are for electric feed strengths in a certain distance, and there are no or almost no total radiated power measurements. So this is really some um, some big problem and some big issue. Okay, so then we can discuss how to convert the results. And to this, for, to, to do this, we need to define something first, which is called electrical size of, of some equipment under test. So let's assume we have some equipment under test, once again, like the computer here, like the laptop. And then we put a virtual sphere around this and we measure the radius of the sphere. This is what we call A. And then from our frequency of interest and the wavelengths, uh, we can also calculate a wave number. And wave number has the unit one over meter. The radius has the unit meter. So these units will cancel each other. So this K times A is some unitless, some dimensionless quantity. And this is what we call electrical size of an object. And okay, there are some questions remaining. So what really belongs to, to my equipment? Is it just the computer, just the laptop here? Does the cable also belong to it? Do I need to take this cable into account when measuring the, the radius? And to which extent do I need to use the cable? But let's say we, we, we somehow know how to deal with it. We, we have some size of our object. And now we can distinguish two cases. And the first case is this K times A is smaller or considerably smaller than one. And in this case, radiation pattern looks like a donut. Unfortunately, today at the Buffet, we don't have any donut. I should have brought a donut from a bakery, to, but everyone knows a donut. And um, so the radiation pattern of Every electrical small EUT, no, no matter how complex it will be, will more or less look like a donut. Sometimes the donut will be, will have a kind of a strange shape. It will be a little asymmetric, but everything looks like a donut. And to measure the, the, the maximum emission of this donut, it's really sufficient if you would measure from a 90 degree direction. So if you measure from this direction, from the back, from this side, and from here, you would measure the same in every case. And even if we would like um, sample in, in this sphere here, so from the top, you would measure nothing, but from here, we would measure the maximum. From here, we would measure the maximum. From the bottom, we would measure nothing. So from this donut, it's fairly easy to get the, the, the maximum um, dimension the maximum emission of this radiation pattern. So for electrically large EUTs, it's looking more, more difficult and more different. Let me go to full screen. So this is some video that Magnus Heuer from Swedish Defense Research Organization has created, I think also something like 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And it's really based on measurement. It's not a simulation, it's based on measurement. And they have taken a rather large object, um, something like a, like a cabinet size, and measured the emission for different frequencies. And so here you can see the frequencies running up. Um, here you can see something like the, the maximum level that they got. And this plot here is always normalized to the maximum. And it's one spherical cut of radiation. And you can see that, um, for example, in this case, if we would measure at, at 90 degree angles, so here, 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 and here, we would not really get maximum emission. The maximum emission moves around. And it's very difficult to predict where your maximum emission will be. And sometimes it's here, and sometimes it's there, and so on and so on. And even if you... Um, even if you measure in final steps of the turntable, maybe 30 degree, maybe 10 degree, um, still you have just a limited chance to capture the maximum emission. And the thing is, if you go higher and higher and higher in frequency, or if your, if the electrical size of the object gets size in comparison with the wavelengths gets larger and larger and larger, then this radiation pattern gets more and more complex and these lobes of radiation get thinner and smaller and narrower, and it will be 
more challenging and more challenging to capture um, the maximum emission. And, and this is a problem that everyone has when doing measurements with large objects at high frequencies in semi-anechoic chambers. And so it's really, really challenging then to capture um, the maximum emissions. Okay, so let's stop the video. I can, I can maybe fast forward to, uh, I think the video ends at something like 20 gigahertz or 18 gigahertz. So you can see that it's very, looking like a hedgehog. Yeah? So you have very, very many of these radiation lobes and they are very, very, very thin. And I think it was, it was a large, like a cabinet size, um, something, something like a radiator. So it was, it was definitely larger like a laptop, maybe something in the size of a refrigerator or washing machine, something like this. But it was not super large. I think they used some, yeah, I think they used something like a comp generator. Um, to, to really, or maybe, maybe they also just used, um, a tracking generator and, um, and the spectrum analyzer so they, that they would have a source at each and every, a reliable source at each and every frequency that they measure. I'm, I'm not really sure about the details, um, of this measurement if they, for each frequency really rotated it. Uh, so how did they arrange the loop of these measurements? But, Magnus Hoyer, he should, he should know about this. This is now a new object in the reading, the shapes of, but, uh, you can, uh, around the, you can do the test with something like that. That means that just placing the new key in 90, uh, 180, 270, uh, zero degrees doesn't make sense. Exactly. Uh, Exactly, exactly. Th that, that's exactly the point. So it will be, um, so for the, um, for the donut like radiation pattern of a dipole, of a small dipole, it's very easy to capture the maximum emission. But for the video that I've just shown, it gets more and more challenging to do so. Yeah. So, um, here's just one from a particular frequency. And so this is, I think, where they started the measurement, 500 megahertz, uh, 0.5 gigahertz. And there it still looks fairly simple, the radiation pattern. But once again, if you measure at zero degree, or let's say here's zero degree, 90 degree, 180 degree, uh, 270 degree, you will not capture maximum emission. So already here, you would have to do the measurement in steps of, let's say, 30 degree. And then you would have a nice, and the question is also how the, the antenna was direction or we just put antenna or quite type one the beam. Yeah, but but the thing is this is this is really based on measured data, on experimental data. It's it's not a simulation. Okay, so the higher the frequency, the larger the problem. And if you really would turn your turntable in small steps going to 10 degree, going to 5 degree, going at very high frequencies to, to 2 or 1 degree, then it really takes us a very, very long time um, to do the measurement. So you, 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 you obviously would not like to do this. Okay, so then to, to really convert the results from one environment to the next environment, we need to introduce uh, another physical quantity, which is called directivity. And it's defined as the power flux density in a certain direction, um, divided by the, the average power flux density in all the directions. And so then th this would be a function of your um, azimuth and polar angle. So it would depend on the direction. And now we take the maximum of all these directions called this maximum directivity. And this is the interesting thing for, for this EMC measurements, because you are interested in the maximum radiation into the main lobe of this radiator. And so from theory, you can calculate that for a short dipole, once again, for this donut shaped like radiation pattern, maximum directivity is 1.5 or three halves and converted into dB. This is something like this 1.76 here. And for some, Electrically large EUT, as we have seen before in the video, it 
can be in the range of up to 10, maybe, maybe a little higher and, and 10 on a, on a linear scale is of course also 10 on a dB scale, something like this. But, um, unintentional radiators, so de devices that are not built to radiate into a certain direction will also have limited directivity. And if you want to have something that has really high directivity, like a parabolic antenna, then you need to take some measures to really make it um, as directive as possible. But unintentional radiators typically do not have this super high directivities. And so um, in, in some standard or in some rule, to convert reverb measurements, total radiated power measurements into semi-echoic uh, measurements, uh, people just assumed a directivity of three, yeah, which is somewhere in between here. And but they, at this time where they proposed this, they had no real idea how it really is. And so later on they said, we were not good, we were lucky. <laughs> so by, by selecting this number of three for the directivity. But okay, directivity, is the main quantity that you need to convert these results. But the problem is you don't know this and no one knows it. If you ask a manufacturer here, you have, you have made this laptop. What is the radiating directivity of the laptop? Everyone will say, I don't know. I have no clue. So should be three equal 10 DPI. Uh, I think because this is here defined in terms of power and not in, not in terms of field strengths. Um, I would say it's for, 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 for powers, you have factor of 10 means, means 10 dB. So, so here, this is, this is really meant to be in terms of power, not of, not of field strengths. Okay. So, and you can also see here. So now we can try to correlate or try to convert total radiated power using this directivity into some field strengths in a certain distance and power is proportional to square of field strengths. And this would be for some fully anechoic environment for some fully anechoic room. And so there what you, what you also need is free space wave impedance and you need to have the distance from the source and this is like the, um, the radius, no, it's like the, the surface area of the sphere. So if, if you know the direct, if you would know the directivity of your equipment under test, it would be no problem to correlate total radiated power with field strengths in a certain distance. And for fully anechoic Rome formula is very simple. So if we go to the semi-anechoic chamber, semi-anechoic environment, there is an additional geometry factor that takes into account this one reflection that you have on the ground or that takes into account the superposition of the direct path and the one reflected path. So this geometry factor can, can range or will range between zero and two total negative construction or deconstruction of the waves and, um, and total positive construction. And so by doing this height scan, you would somehow assure that this geometry factor turns out to be two. And so then the remaining question is what to do with this directivity. And there's a nice paper of a former colleague of mine who had more or less my position in Magdeburg before and then moved to be a professor at Technical University of Dresden in Germany, Hans-Georg Krauthäuser. And also now already 13 years ago, he published a quite popular paper in the IEEE transactions. Once again, IEEE, yeah, uh, also a big publisher of journals and organizer of conferences. And this is called statistical analysis of the correlation of emission limits for established, which is the semi-nucleic chamber and alternative test sites, which, which is the reverb chamber. And this paper summarizes lots of ideas and stuff that has done before on modeling the directivity. And so, um, some of the results of this paper I, I present here and in the slides, um, there are also links to Octave Online. And on this Octave Online, so Octave is like MATLAB and, and there, there, the full simulation runs or you can, you can repeat these simulations and you can recreate these graphs and you can also change the parameters there. You could go to different distances. You could do, use different sizes of the object and so on, uh, change the frequency range. So 
hier results are shown between 100 megahertz and 10 gigahertz and the conversion factor that is displayed here on the y-axis is the square of the maximum field strengths normalized to the total radiated power. It's exactly this conversion factor that you need. You measure, for example, total radiated power in, in a reverb chamber, you want to have maximum field strengths or, or vice versa. And so th the example here is shown for some object that is yeah, maybe like the size of a refrigerator, some larger device, measurement distance 10 meter. And then what is shown is the, the average result, the median, which is the 50th percentile, and the spread between the fifth and the 95th percentile. So at the end, of course, this is statistics. Yeah? It depends on um, what your directivity, what, what your device on test really has, has as directivity, but um, that, there's a statistical model behind there, and the model just assumes that we have many small dipole sources or point sources distributed on the surface of uh, the equipment under test. And we have done some measurements uh, that show that this that this model works quite nicely. Okay, so this is semi chamber 2RC. You, you, you can see that um, these the, the, the changes and let's say the small dip in this curve, this is due to the, the ground plane, plane reflection in the height scan. Um, so then if you convert fully anechoic room to reverb, you don't have the ground plane, you don't have this reflection there, you, that's why you get a more smooth curve. Um, this is also something that I discussed yesterday with Christoph, um, that if you want to check if your semi chamber works, sometimes a nice idea to put uh, a broadband noise source in there, and then you would also expect to get a rather smooth curve and result over frequency if your broadband white noise Gaussian noise source works nicely and you would not expect to this curve to go up and down and up and down and up and down and it's the same here so um, you can see that for low frequencies we we um, uh, we go to this limit value of directivity for the dipole and then the higher we go in frequency the higher directivity grows and that's why we expect to have a higher maximum field strength for the same total radiated power and the uh, the last curve, no, this was, yeah, the, the last curve is um, correlation or conversion between fully anechoic room and reverb chamber, but now as a matter of not frequency directly, but this electrical size of the EUT. And once again, if you would like to repeat these simulations, check it out. Um, there will be links to this Octave Online sites in the slides. So, the question that we end up now is, what type of or which type of measurement environment would you like to have? So if you do the measurement in the semi chamber, um, your, your environment is nice and deterministic because you exactly know, okay, if I put my device on test there and let it radiate at a certain distance, I might get this and this field strength. Um, or if you do immunity testing, you can do the very nice same calibration. I exactly know for this and this input power, I will reach this in this field strength. So the environment is nice and deterministic, but your EUT is stochastic. You don't know about the EUT. The EUT is random because you don't know the radiation pattern of your EUT. You don't know in which directions it will radiate, what, what, um, steps, what degrees of the turntable you need to measure to capture this maximum emission. So on the other hand, if you go to a reverb chamber, in the reverb chamber, the environment is kind of random because you have all these reflections and then you take the stirrer and you know, only know the field um, on a statistical basis. Yeah? You know, on average, I get this in this field, but there is still a certain spread and you still have this remaining... Um, statistical anisotropy and inhomogeneity of the field, which is maybe not that nice, but the good thing is now your EUT is deterministic. No, you don't care in which directions your EUT will radiate, you will always capture the emission of your equipment under test. And so there, there, there's another um, 
colleague from University of Eindhoven, who is also very active in the reverb community, Ramiro Serra. And he, he always says, or he compares it with the song of uh, Frank Sinatra. Maybe you know it, New York, New York. If you can make it there, you can make it everywhere. So that the, the reverb chamber is like the New York of the EMC test environments. If the equipment under test can pass the test there, it will also pass in all other test environments because this is maybe the most severe one. You, you cannot hide in the reverb chamber. If, if your equipment will radiate to the top or to the bottom or no matter in which direction, you will always capture this emission. And also for immunity testing, you have this stochastic field virtually coming from all the directions at the, at the same time. Okay, so advantages and disadvantages, a little bit comparing apples with oranges, um, but the, the, the problem with this randomness here is that it grows with frequency. The higher you go in frequency, as you have seen in the video, the more severe will be your problem. And you would need to measure more and more and more and more steps of your turntable to really capture the maximum emission. And the, the, the advantage of this randomness here is it, it's independent of frequency. It just depends on how many stereo positions you measure. And Typically, you can do 12. It's not, not a lot, but it's already working. And you can, um, you can measure more, maybe like 36, something like this. And then your, your uncertainty goes down, but it stays constant with frequency. So even if you go to very high frequencies, 18 gigahertz, as, as you've seen in the video, still this 36 stereo positions will be sufficient to get a good a reasonable statistical uncertainty of the measurement. So this is nice. This stays constant over frequency. This grows with frequency. Okay, so then we can look into some practical measurements that we have done in Magdeburg. So a colleague of mine also built some artificial equipment under test uh, with some kind of loop or transmission line antennas on different sites. Also um, excited by a comp generator on the inside and we did emission measurements as you can see in our reverb chamber with the metallic walls around and we repeated these emission measurements in our large semi-echoic chamber and here's a comparison between the results so the um, green curve is the one in the reverb chamber which is a bit more noisy because you see there the um, the statistical uncertainty of, of the field within the reverb chamber and the curve in the semi-echoic chamber is more smooth over frequency. And so the results have been converted assuming a directivity, a wrong directivity of just one. So the difference between the two curves is really, the, let's say, the, re, the, 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 the the remaining directivity, the through directivity of the equipment under test. But you can see that in general, these curves from their behavior or frequency agree quite well. And um, let's say these ups and downs, the resonances that you see are resonances of the equipment under self it test, uh, of, of the equipment under test itself, of the transmission line antennas and loops antennas on, on the surface. And so then what he also did, uh, he did lots of other stuff, but what I selected for this talk is he repeated the measurements for different step sizes of the turntable in the semi chamber. So if you measure just with 90 degree steps, you get this green curve. And then if you repeat the measurement with finer steps of the turntable, um, going down to... Exactly, and I think this is some, some kind of max hold. Mm, and so if you, if you measure more directions, if you, if you sample more points of this radiation pattern, then you also get a higher maximum field strength. And probably if you would go down to even smaller steps, like five degree, two degree, one degree, then this curve would, especially at the high frequencies, once again, might go up and might go up a little bit. And so th this year, and you can see that the difference sometimes can be up to 5 dB, something like this also here on the, at the end. So um, this, if you have large objects, if you go to higher frequencies, the sampling in 90 degree steps is 
very probably not sufficient to capture maximum emissions inside a semi-echoic chamber um, radiating emission measurement. Okay, so to summarize, um, yeah, what, what, what you would like to do for a robust EMC measurement in a semi-echoic chamber, um, or what you would do in a semi-echoic chamber is to do also these kind of robust measurements, but what is holding you back is the EOT directivity. You, you don't know this. Yeah? I cannot stress this enough. Um, and you cannot assume this donut shaped radiation pattern of a dipole also for higher frequencies is. It will not be the case as you've seen in the video. So what you could do is you could go to a reverb chamber, do measurements there, also at high frequencies and small wavelengths, and it will independent of position, polarization, and so on, because you have this isotropic homogeneous field. It will also not depend on directivity of your EUT, but you measure total radiated power and there are no, no limits for this. So you get a nice result, but you cannot directly apply it uh, for some standardized measurement because there's no limit for this. So everything good is never together. Yeah, so the, the coming back to the title of the talk, what you would like to have is you want to have a robust measurement, which means does not matter exactly where to place the device on test. It does not matter how exactly to place and orient cables. Just put it in there and somehow measure. Um, you, you want to have it fast within a reasonable time and you want to have it precise so it should be repeatable and uh, it should be replicate, um, should be easy to replicate and so on. So if we, if we try to combine this robust and fast, then we do measurements in reverb chambers, for sure. It, it goes quite quick and we have this robust environment, but it's, it's, it's not precise in terms that at the end, okay, we only know our equipment under test has a problem at this certain frequency. There will be a high emission at this frequency, but still we don't know in which direction will it radiate. And we have no, no clue, um, looking at the device. What is in this direction? Is it some, some hole in the shielding? Is there some aperture? Is there some display? You have no information how to debug the device from this type of measurement. So we could also try to do a robust and precise measurement. Uh, going into a semi-echoic chamber and doing full sampling, really measuring very, very fine steps of the turntable. Then, then you get the, the perfect full picture at each and every frequency. How will the radiation pattern of your device on the test look like? What will be the maximum emission? And in which direction will it radiate? So you can have some information for debugging and saying, okay, there, I need to change something at my device, at my prototype to lower the emission into this certain direction. But, this will take a very, very long time. So for sure, it's not fast. And then, of course, you can go to, um, you, you can do the same, but you can undersample and just measure 90 degrees or just measure um, 30 degrees, something like this, or just concentrate on certain frequencies. So it will be precise and fast, but it, then it will not be robust because you have to have some a priori knowledge about your radiator, which frequencies are of interest, um, how will the radiation pattern look like, something like this. So the, the, the perfect test environment, which is somewhere in the center of this Venn diagram, unfortunately does not exist yet. Okay, so this concludes my talk. Thanks for your attention. And uh, once again, I would be happy to answer some more questions.